Welcome to the Think Christian Podcast, where we talk about faith and pop culture because there's no such thing as secular. I'm Josh Larson, your host and senior producer over at thinkchristian.net. Well, we made it to our final episode celebrating the best pop culture of 2023. It's time to talk movies. All of the top 10 lists have been compiled. All of the roundtables have been convened, and there seems to be consensus on one thing. 2023 was a great year for film. Now, Claude Acho and Ruslan Hernandez, they're going to be joining me to talk about a couple of our favorites, but I'm glad we also received a bunch of listener feedback so that we could spread the wealth and represent the richness of the movie year. Let's start with this note from listener Jonathan Kana. Jonathan always chimes in for this episode each year. Here's what he wrote. I want to check in with one of my favorite films of 2023, one that I suspect has been largely forgotten here at the end of the year. I'm talking about Matt Johnson's surprisingly riveting biopic, Blackberry, which chronicles the rise and fall of the eponymous device brand that ushered in the era of the smartphone only to collapse under the weight of its own hubris. It's a story that I never believed could be told with such thrilling verve. But in Johnson's very capable cinematic hands, the tale becomes a near Shakespearean tragedy, one that majors less on technology and commercialism than on the lengths we're willing to go in service of our own ambitions. The spiritually devastating final image of this movie is in the running for my favorite closing shot of the year. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Let's hear from a couple of more Jonathans uh, while we're on the theme. Jonathan Coppage said, I don't know that there's a Christian hook, but the most impactful movie this year is definitely Eileen, a swooningly constructed thriller that doesn't let the genre down. And then here's Jonathan Kreitz, Godzilla Minus One. Put it in the Eucatastrophe Hall of Fame. Very moving story and resolution, memorable characters, humor that did not detract from the story but served it. I really loved it. We have more listener feedback to get to, I promise, from other folks who are not named Jonathan. We'll share that later in the show. For now, let's bring on Claude and Rosalind to talk about three of our favorite films from last year. Claude and Rosalind, a happy 2024 to you both. How's the new year treating you so far? How's life in Charlottesville, Claude? Life in Charlottesville is good. This is coming on a snow day, so there's a lot of joy uh, happening here in Charlottesville. A lot of sledding. You know, we we get reports of snow, but it's not often fulfilled. And this time around, it was fulfilled. So there's a lot of joy in the Acho household and across the city. People are being <laughs> safe, sledding, having a good time. So it's a good start to the new year. Oh, that sounds great. Here here in Chicago, our our snow we did get a little bit, but then it it's like below zero here. So it immediately just froze to rock. So not quite as not quite as playful. Rosalind, I was though happy to last week be out your way, Southern California, really enjoying the sunshine <laughs> before, ha- before having to come back here. But how about you, Rosalind? How's your 2024 so far? been pretty good so far it's a little bit cloudy here so i live a little bit like two two hours north of southern california and i mean we also get to see the mountains around us covered in snow but it never really reaches us we're in the valley Mm. so uh, but it had been kind of warm the last year so it's kind of nice to to have some clouds to get some rain and to actually have it be a little bit colder than it has been in the past gotcha nice yeah just being able to see the snow on the mountains that is that is beautiful well Thanks for joining me for this this episode. I want to have you two on for this show because well, because I like I love talking movies with the both of you, but I also <laughs> know that the picks you guys made for among your favorite films of the year, they they worked really well together. We have, you know, behind the scenes how we put these three episodes together. There's kind of this giant document and everyone in the podcast team writes down all their favorite movies, music, TV, and then it becomes this fun game, for me at least, of pairing people and topics up and seeing how things work. So with the picks you two brought, at least in in the movie category, we have a great mix, I think. We have a family comedy that dramedy, comedy drama, that most people have heard of. We have an animated film from Japan. And then we have a tiny, tiny indie that more people should hear about. So 
Let's jump into these. Maybe we should ease listeners in with that familiar one, which is your pick, Rosalind, the delightful adaptation of the 1970 Judy Bloom novel for young adult readers. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. So what was it about this one that made it one of your favorites from last year, Rosalind? Yeah, I think for me, you know, as someone who thinks about young people and their spirituality and how they understand God, this was really interesting to watch as someone, you know, as a young person, Margaret is trying to figure out what she believes or how she relates to God and seeing the kind of like the generational aspects of religion, right? Like her parents are kind of a little bit traumatized by religion. So they don't really like share their religion or their trauma with her, but that causes like her own questions and turmoil in the way that she relates to God. And so for me, it was really interesting to see that aspect of how spirituality is passed down to children, especially to teenagers, when they're asking these questions, right? Of like, who am I? Who am I in relation to God and like in relation to others? And and so that's what a, that's what I really liked about that. Yeah, it definitely digs deeply into that. Doesn't avoid. I mean, how could it? It's right there in the title, but it doesn't avoid some of these questions, even though it is a mainstream rather than uh, a faith based movie. Was this one, Claude, that you saw when it came out earlier in 2023, or, or did you catch up with it more recently? I ha- I have not seen it. What I did was, I, I know Judy Bloom. She's big in our house. And I read the TC piece uh, by Isabel Bishop. Um, nice. And I'm you know, f- roughly familiar with the story. But I think your point that you just made is interesting. This sort, obviously, it's part of the novel. But this sort of film coming not from a you know faith-based production company necessarily is putting these sort of questions in what seems like a really kind of earnest and genuine way Mm -hmm. that I think is, um, yeah, really important and I think instructive. So I I, I like that piece that I read about sort of what it means to kind of, how do you find and hear from, hear God when you're asking these questions at that age um, where so many things are sort of up for grabs. What I learned about religion is that it makes people fight. And every religion says the same thing. If you pray to God, he'll listen to you and help you and make things better. But I've prayed and prayed, and everything just gets worse. Yeah, I wanted to bring that that piece uh, to our conversation by Isabel Bishop and, and share this part from it. I like how she describes Margaret's predicament here. With no framework for how to approach God or prayer, Margaret feels lost at sea, especially when she can't find God in the ways she expects. She views him as a cosmic Santa, asking him to expedite her development into a woman and becoming frustrated when that doesn't happen. And then Isabel goes on to talk about the ways God instead uses a still small voice and maybe works through others in Margaret's life. Uh, She cites the passage in 1 Kings where God speaks to Elijah in an unexpected and muted way. And so I was curious, maybe you could talk a little bit more about that, Rosalind, especially maybe in the context of youth, when you are working with youth, what expectations might be for youth today about how God speaks? And then are there ways you've seen that speaking surprise them or maybe even, I don't know, surprise you? I'm just curious what you think more in general about some of those ideas beyond the film. You know, I think just like Margaret, you know, we, a lot of young people and even a lot of people in church in general, you know, in Christianity believe, you know, oh, we talk to God and we like, we pray and we definitely can do that. And it can also feel really like one way (laughs) because we don't really hear God speaking back to us or we don't really realize when God is sending someone the way, you know, Margaret's friend kind of like teaches her some things or just like opens her up to other ideas about spirituality in, um, in the Jewish tradition. You know, I think for me, something that I have been learning to to do is to just be in God's presence and just like a prayer of presence. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's sometimes something that we forget that we can just enjoy God's presence and we can just let God delight in us. And we don't have to say something. (laughs) We don't have to receive a message out of that, but just being God's presence and being, letting ourselves be delighted in is something that, that I think I've been trying to do a lot more for myself. Yeah. Relieving some of that pressure of that it's on us to make something happen. Mm -hmm. I think that's something we see in the movie 
the pressure that Margaret feels. It's almost like the freedom her parents offer her just ratchets up the pressure. And she's like, okay, now this is on me. I've got to make this happen. And I do have to say the lead performance as Margaret, Abby Ryder Fortson, she's just delightful. Some of the the double takes she has when faced with um, <laughs> all the embarrassing situations she's experiencing as a girl this age. And how about Rachel McAdams as the mom, Barbara, a role that's expanded for the movie from what it was in the novel. But I, I think it really does help kind of broaden the experience we're seeing rather than this tunnel experience of, of a young girl. Now we're seeing what it might be a bit like for a mother um, to help a girl work through this. Uh, did you have, Rosalind, a favorite performance? Uh, Kathy Bates is also great here as the grandmother. Um, I just thought the performances were really good in this film too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think I liked all of them. <laughs> I don't have one that was my favorite, but I did really like the honesty and the earnestness, mm. as you mentioned before, with which um, the directors and the screenwriters really approached a topic of of a young woman in a very vulnerable and very exciting age, right, of of this uh, period in her life that it could have been, it could have been approached differently in ways that have been approached in the past, but this was um, really honoring to to her as a young woman. Yeah, honesty, I think, is a good word. Yeah, you see it in how the film was conceived and executed and, and in those performances, too, as you said. All right, well, let's move to your pick, Claude, and this is the Japanese animated film I was referencing. Uh, we have a listener who's going to set this one up for you. ATC, this is Chad from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, calling in about my favorites of 2023. My favorite film of 2023 comes from one of our great directors. It's a late period masterpiece from this 80 plus year old director. And the film is complex and left me with war questions rather than answers. And yes, that film is The Boy and the Heron by amazing filmmaker Hayao Miyazaki. By far the best movie I saw all year because it left me with so many questions. I really didn't, I still, after seeing it twice, do not really know what it's all about, but that's the beauty of it. It was something that I experienced and it left me, it was like no other experience I had this year. I highly recommend anyone who hasn't seen it go in blind. You may not know what to think about it right away, but I can guarantee that it is a wonderful, beautiful experience and a weird experience, which is saying a lot from a director who gave us Spirited Away and Princess Mononoke. Thanks, Chad. Chad also shared some music picks. Uh, we didn't hear those there, but he mentioned he mentioned Sufjan Stevens' Javelin and then an album with a very, very long title from King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. So okay. we'll, we've added those to our long list of music picks over at thinkchristian.net. But as for the movies, uh, Chad described The Boy and the Heron as wonderful, beautiful, and weird. Does that ring true for you, Claude? And, and what is this film all about? Or at least what happens in it? Maybe we should start there. I think that's a great description. Uh, wonderful, beautiful, and weird. I think, you know, Miyazaki films uh, is known for Spirited Away, Ponyo, my neighbor Totoro, Kiki's Delivery Service, these, these, these great classics that have a sort of playfulness, but also this quirkiness about them. And a lot of his movies are centered around young people like kids or people around the age of kind of like 10 to 12, um, sort of trying to figure out their place, uh, their place in the world. And his movies deal with, um, they're both playful, but they also have really deep themes as well. Sort of like, how do we exist in relation to creation and the environment? How do we deal with war? How do we deal with loss? All these sort of things. So The Boy and the Heron was you know, highly, highly anticipated. And it follows some of those same themes. A boy named Mojito, his, his mother has died in a hospital fire. This is in the context uh, in, uh, in, in Japan, uh, World War II. And he now moves to the countryside with his dad, who is a factory owner producing weapons. His dad marries um, the sister of his late wife. And now they're trying to find uh, find themselves, you know, af after this grief. Mihito is, uh, you know, dealing with grief and rage. And uh, this heron keeps appearing. And he sets out on sort of this journey into another world with this heron who is both kind of a, not, not quite a friend, just this trickster figure. So it is beautiful. It is um, wonderful. And it is weird. 
I think in a lot of ways, uh, the boy and the heron is sort of like a Rorschach test, you know, like one of those ink blots, mm. and you can sort of um, <laughs> see in it whatever you want to see. There's and and that's not a slight on the movie. I think that's because of the power of the visuals, and also there's just this density of emotion and wonder in the films. And so I think if you come to the movie looking for just sort of like, okay, what happens, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, plot wise you're going to be upset and confused. But if you yeah. go along for the ride, there's a lot of wonder to be had, which I, I think we'll probably get into here in a moment. Yeah, I, I think that's good advice. I've been talking about it in terms of, you know, emotional truth, but I almost like the expansiveness you're mentioning more, Claude, because it's not that you need to figure out what the emotional truth is. You're going to bring your own to it, um, depending on the deeper we get into this fantasy world um, and what this boy experiences there. Yes, what it means for him and his narrative as we've come to know it, but also what it means for us and and the concerns um, that we're bringing to the movie. Because it expands greatly from this very intimate story, this kid just like, you know, messing around with this heron into this very existential uh, experience that incorporates those things you mentioned, war and mm-hmm. personal loss, you know, lo- losing a mother, becoming part of a new family, all these sorts of things, fitting in at school. We see him struggling to fit in at school in those early scenes, mm-hmm. and that reverberates into this fantasy mm-hmm. as well. So all that being said, and, and agreeing with you that there's no puzzle to be solved here, can I can I push you, Claude, to ask a little bit? You know what did resonate with you at least? Like what kind of it it stirred up in you, or the things it made you think about? Maybe it is one of these themes we mentioned. Maybe it's something entirely differently. I mean, I think I think there's a lot of angles. I think I was really, you know, one thing that stood out to me was sort of the father son angle. You know, so here is the this boy who is grieving and he's lashing out. So he's very he's very angry and, and understandably he doesn't know how to process all that all that's happening. Really, his father is sort of just trying to protect and to provide, and he thinks that's enough. And so he's sort of mm. you know, in one scene, um, Mihito. Um, you know, he gets in a fight with kids at school, but he also takes a rock and just smashes himself on the head. And yeah. um, and he has this gash and it and it sort of, it stays with him. It's it's part of his new image, part of this transformation. And, you know, his father sees that in a sort of, you know, his father produces weapons. So he's sort of like, whoever did this, you know, we're going to get to them. And he, he's sort of trying to use power to protect his son from really experiencing all of these sort of stages and elements of grief. And he thinks it's just sort of power and protection. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's something interesting there about the father-son relationship, but I think it's also related to, I think one of the themes that stood out to me is sort of like, how do you, how do you grieve? How do you come to terms with loss? Because as Mojito later in the film enters into sort of this kind of cosmic, fantastical, like multiverse, like this, um, there's a scene where there's all these rooms that are like different realities or universes. And eventually Mojito encounters a character that sort of offers him a chance to kind of like remake the world, kind of like um, kind of sort of take over things and and try to uh, usher in the sort of utopia or something like that. I'm trying to explain as best as I can. <laughs> um, and uh, it's a chance for Mojito to sort of like escape in a way. And there's a choice between like living in the world that he knows, you know, with all of its grief and its pain and then trying to escape. And I think that sort of question is a really poignant one. Like how do we mm. keep going? You know, how do we keep living in a place where we do, you know, we do lose our parents, we do lose our moms, we do, we do experience these things. And I think the movie has, you know, the movie has a lot to say about that in a way that is not, you know, purely propositional. You just, you sort of feel it and you carry it with you. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great way to describe it. So, Rosalind, I know this is one, and it's still in theaters, so you haven't seen, but hopefully we'll get a chance to catch. But otherwise, where are you with Miyazaki? Is is this a filmmaker um, you, you've seen a lot of, or, or maybe one or two? And um, what have you made of what you have seen? Yeah, I've seen, I think, one or two, and definitely weird and awesome <laughs> and fantastical, but really, really deep. Um, mm. and touches on very human aspects of of grief and of just what does it mean to be human, you know? Sure. Um, and with this particular one, I haven't seen it, but I read a little bit about it. And I, it's so interesting that there's, you know, there's different adults in Mijito's life, right? That are like mm-hmm. his dad, you know, like, we're going to do this through power. There's the 
the grand uncle who um, kind of presents him with like the escape and the fantasy, right? And then his new mom and then his actual mom. So these are all like people that had impact in his life. And through his process in this adventure, he kind of comes to learn that there needs to be a balance of mm. like, yes, like these are all people that are part of my life. And yes, I do want to escape right now. I'm really grieving. I really uh, want to find my mom, but also we can't do that anymore. Like, how do we, how do we keep and integrate what we have taken from each person and take that back to real life with us? Um, it's a really great, um, coming of age and like understanding of emotions and grief that, um, that even adults, you know, we have a hard time <laughs> For doing <sure>. that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I found it as helpful processing that sort of stuff as an adult, as I'm sure maybe more so than I would as a, mm -hmm. as a kid. And yeah, it's interesting. Those adult relationships you're talking about, Rosalind, you know, the father, son jumped out at you, Claude. For me, it was very much that, that was quite I think instructive too, as you point out, you know, that he is a weapons maker and how that affects my toe as well. But for me, it was the relationship with his stepmom, his aunt. This is, you know, this woman who wants to be his mother because it's striking that she's very caring and loving towards him. This mm -hmm. isn't like the an evil stepmother situation at all. But that, you know, in some ways makes it more frustrating for him. You feel like he's looking for something to fight against. He is. And when yeah. yeah, and when she doesn't present that, it's it's a different level of inner turmoil. And so it was their relationship that I enjoyed tracing throughout the movie as well. Um, now, Claude, you mentioned a couple things that, you know, we're talking about a, a Japanese filmmaker, um, you know, who I know is familiar with Western movies, but obviously is steeped in Eastern tradition, Eastern spirituality. And so it can be tricky, you know, mm -hmm. bringing sort of a think Christian perspective on these things. But I think you touched on three shared points of commonality, maybe. One is, um, you know, creation care, mm -hmm. nature, the environment. Another one is this emphasis on peace that all his movies have, mm -hmm. especially in opposition to power and violence. Uh, that is also a shared Christian idea. And then this larger one, this, this question of how are we going to live in a broken world? Mm -hmm. Are we going to live in a way that contributes to the brokenness, that shuts us off, ourselves off from the brokenness, mm -hmm. or that might actually work towards restoration. So these are all common touch points, which we we probably don't need to dig into now, mainly because we're going to dig into them with the TC Movie Club. This has been mentioned on previous episodes, but our next winter session is going to be all about Miyazaki. Um, and that's coming up on March 6th. And so just mentioning that here, so people who are interested, haven't seen The Boy and the Heron yet, have time to, to see that. And then you can join us um, on March 6th online. This is online. I think christian.net slash movie club is where you can sign up and we'll shoot you an email with the Zoom link and all that. Uh, but I'm really excited for this, starting to watch a couple other Miyazaki movies. Uh, probably what I'm going to focus on is this idea of creation care that you kind of mentioned, Claude. But as we've seen, there are so many other rich directions we can go in and we'll have time to touch on a lot of other stuff. Uh, regarding uh, Miyazaki as well. So go ahead and sign up for that at thinkchristian.net slash movie club. Anything else, Claude, we left out? I, I know you are a big Miyazaki uh, fan, so I don't want to move on unless there's sure. more you wanted to touch on. I mean, I think, uh, you know, it's interesting with his movies, it, it, it's so wonderful to see sort of the culmination of a lot of imagery, um, a lot of sort of archetypes for his characters. Um, and so those who have seen some of the films before will really enjoy that. You also see sort of new uh, new kind of models of characters, these, these man-eating parakeets that are both like uh, hilarious oh, yeah. and horrifying. You know, so that just sort of <laughs> playfulness, um, um, but but without sacrificing substance. And then I think it's also good to, to mention the English um, the English voice actors were mm. were incredible. Robert Pattinson as the um, as the Heron uh, did a great job. Star studded cast. Um, I think everybody everybody crushed it. It was really wonderful. So definitely want to shout uh, you know shout them out for for their work there. Yeah, one thing I wanted to note about the vocal performances and Pattinson in particular, um, I saw the subtitled version. So I heard the Japanese voice actors, but I have also seen clips or heard clips of Pattinson. And I like how he modeled his performance after 
the actual Japanese vocal performance because wow. it's very distinctive. I mean, you, you would never know it's Robert Pattinson, right, Claude? It's like right. a totally different yep. raspy smoker's voice yep. type thing. <laughs> so I like that he kind of honored the original while still, you know, giving it his own his own touch. Yeah, I didn't so know that's, that. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, that was that was cool to find out. So that's the boy and the heron. Um, we'll round things out with my pick, which is All Dirt Road's Taste of Salt. So I saw this very small film at the Chicago International Film Festival last October. It's the feature debut from poet and now filmmaker Raven Jackson. And it's more of a memory piece than anything else. It's, it's made up of these snippets uh, from the life of an adult woman uh, named Mac, who grew up in rural Mississippi. So the movie drifts from, you know, early moments when she's little fishing with her family. There are uh, moments from her teen years, hanging out with friends, flirting with boys. And then we jump ahead till she, when she's older, um, experiencing single pregnancy. Um, and it's not chronological either. So we're kind of floating in and out of these moments. And Jackson connects them through shared kind of mirrored imagery and very perceptive editing. Uh, one of these one of these recurring connections is the image of hands. So, you know, we'll see her as a kid touching the scales of a fish, maybe later holding a boy's hand or cradling her baby. We see her hands. And I saw over on Letterboxd, kind of a, a movie social site for logging what you watch, uh, Sam Van Hogren had a lovely way of describing this in his review. Uh, and Sam is the producer for Film Spotting, the other podcast I'm on with Adam Kempinar. Uh, now, Sam didn't go for All Dirt Roads quite as much as I did, but, but he did say this about the movie. As a meditation on the way God's love is experienced most viscerally in the form of touch— and also how the painful absence of that love can feel when touch is absent. This is an often lovely thing to look at. So I do want to hear from you guys what you think about the movie in general, but I was also hoping we can use it maybe to further explore this notion Sam brought up. It's not it's not one as much as I observe the use of hands in the movie. I've given a ton of thought to, but the role of touch, physical touch in the Christian life. Mm. And depending on what tradition you've experienced, I imagine this is maybe a familiar question or maybe it's a surprising, challenging one. Um, what do you think, Rosalyn? Maybe maybe tell me a little bit about your impression of the movie, but I, I'd want to dig into that idea too, if you don't mind. Yeah, so I grew up in a Pentecostal church, so touch, mm -hmm. I am very comfortable, and Latin American, so <laughs> we're very comfortable with touch. This is why I wanted to bring this up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, in in the generation that I grew up in, in the church, it, uh, there's a lot of familiarity. There's a lot of um, comfort giving and even laying of hands when we pray. And so that's very, um, very normal for me. I think when I saw the film, I'm not sure that I so much connected that because partially I think it's part of how I grew up. So it's kind of just didn't there. Stand out. Yeah, it yeah. didn't stand out. Makes um, sense. But what I did stand out to me was the female gaze. And, mm. you know, a lot of the films that we watch ha that are directed by men have the male gaze. And this comes from um, an essay from Laura Mulvey, uh, who talks about this. And even films that aren't directed by men have just kind of had the male gaze in them because that's just the way we've been conditioned to watch film and even see ourselves through the male sure. gaze. But seeing this, um, it wasn't even just a female gaze. It was a female child's gaze. It started with a female child's gaze. And so mm. we see a lot of, you know, as you mentioned, the hands, but it's not just that it's the hands, it's the intention and the feeling behind the movements that are happening, right? She sees her parents dancing and she sees them embrace each other. So she's feeling the love that they're feeling for each other. And then she kind of wants to feel some of that love from her mom, right? She gonna, she's going to go and she tries to talk to her mom. Um, she gets rebuked a little bit there. And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. no, I really felt that like in my heart, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, but it's it's the it's the things that we say without words, 
mm. um, yes. that she's seeing there, that she's yes, experiencing. Yes. And we see that all throughout the film, not just the, the good things, but also the really painful things when she's with Wood. And they're like not saying anything, but they're just looking at each other, like may, barely holding hands or when they give each other a hug. And it's like the longest hug. Like it they, is. they're mm-hmm. saying goodbye to each other, right? And so, um, yeah, for me, it's like, it's some more... And this is something that a lot of women I've seen online kind of referring to the female gaze and hands being part of the female gaze. I think partially it's true, but it goes deeper than that. Um, It's about the emotion behind the actions Mm -hmm. and the sensuality of of our emotions as well, because we feel things in our bodies. We feel Mm -hmm. our emotions and we transmit them through our bodies as well, not just through words. Mm -hmm. I think... When you say it's about the things that we say without words, that clarified for me exactly what this movie is doing. And I I think actually as you're talking, Rosalind, it connects back to, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Mm-hmm. Like this is, we're expecting in that movie, she's expecting, if not a verbal response from God, like a clear action, mm-hmm. um, you know, something that that is communicating to her clearly. Um, but maybe God's love is more akin to something we say without words um, that, that this movie, I feel like, captures so well. And, and you described so well. Um, Claude, you're, you're fresh off watching this. Um, mm-hmm. you, you were telling us before we started recording here. So, so yeah, I want your general impression too, but also would, would love to hear um, what you think along these lines. Yeah. You know, maybe a general impression first. I, I mean, I, I think it, it is really, it makes sense. It was directed by, by a poet. It, it does, it feels like watching a poem. It's sort of unfolding. There's these different snatches um, of moments and memory. I mean, in a lot of ways, it, it's maybe like obvious or just a, a oversimplistic comparison, but it did make me think a lot of A Tree of Life uh, by mm-hmm. Terrence Malick, just sort of like this kind of, this, For sure. um, this tender sort of movement, the way things are uh, portrayed and sort of the emotional feel and the way that um, a movie that operates on that wavelength, how it sort of slows you down and recalibrates you to its own tempo and its own sort of like visuals and language. And you kind of just settle in. Uh, I was really struck by the use of color through the movie and just sort of shots of the back of um, Mac, uh, the the protagonist, the back of her head um, at different ages and stages through her life. So I was really, I, I found it, I found it quite powerful and quite moving. And, you know, for myself, having lived in Memphis, right on the, the Mississippi sort of line, um, I thought I, I, there was, there was a draw for me there. Mm. I think in terms of touch, um, I think that's a, a really potent reflection. Um, there's a Margaret Atwood quote, which came to mind and I just, I just pulled it up. Uh, she said, the novelist Margaret Atwood, she says, touch comes before sight, before speech. It is the first language and the last, and it always tells the truth, which mm. I think is just really fascinating. And I, I do think that is a really rich and fruitful sort of question, like where, where, what is the place of touch, you know, in our in our lives as followers of Jesus, right? I think we know so much of um, how we can pervert things and how much there has been abuse of power um, and of people um, and of touch. What does a flourishing way of embodiment and touch look like? And I think this this movie does point toward that. I was also drawn, Rosalind, to that hug scene between Wood and Mac in the middle of the movie. <laughs> I was like, this hug is really long, but like, there's so much there. And I think there's so many, I think the kind of cliche way to do that or the stereotypical way to do that would be to sort of like imbue that moment with this sort of... Um, it, this sort of like uh, hypersexualized sort of um, engagement, but it's like there's there's just true um, grief and appreciation and sort of loss that's happening in that moment. It's sort of like that's that that that's a real that's that's humane. Um, and so that, that that I thought was probably the standout mo- moment of the movie for me was actually that that really long hug that comes maybe about halfway through. It is possibly uh, the longest hug in movie history, <laughs> and, and I, I think that's to its credit too. You know, it's um, it's almost as if it's going to take as long as those characters need, independent of what we might need or want as viewers. It's like completely left us behind uh, mm-hmm. because there's probably an emotional peak that that scene hits for us as viewers where we're like, okay, they've reunited, you know, they've shared something, uh, you know, it's time in movie terms. This goes back a little bit to what you were saying, Rosalind, what we've been trained to do as viewers in Mm -hmm. movie terms, something new should happen. They should 
kiss more passionately to your point, Claude, Mm -hmm. or they should separate and say goodbye. But no, it just keeps going. And and I had that uncomfortability at first, like, oh, this is this is getting a little weird. And then she holds it, Jackson holds it even longer, where I'm like, oh no, this is this is how long they want it to be. And so it doesn't matter what I want. I'm just, <laughs> you know, I'm just lucky to to be allowed here and and to observe this. Um, because I think it is an example again of that sort of deep, truthful, honest sharing and that touch can give Mm. that does echo maybe a more spiritual understanding of touch. It's not in that scene in particular, and in so many in this movie, it's not that one person is taking from the other for their own good. It's there, there's like a mutual um, love being shared there in in this, in this case somewhere, you know, in between romantic and platonic love. Mm -hmm. But I think that messiness gives it even more potency Mm -hmm. as a spiritual gesture gesture mm-hmm. too. So, so yeah, um, this one, despite all our praise, you know, people might be a little like, eh, it sounds a little weird. I don't know <laughs> if it's for me. Uh, if you do want to watch it now, I think Claude, you can probably say for sure. I think the only way is to, uh, for like about 20 bucks via streaming. Yeah. Uh, is that how you saw it? Yeah, you can purchase it on Amazon, uh, Amazon uh, Video. Uh, you can also rent on Amazon Video for about, I think, five or six dollars. So it's definitely, oh, um, okay. It, it's definitely, it's definitely worth your investigation and your look. Um, and you could pair it with Miyazaki, two two films that are that are cut from uh, the non sort of um, stereotypical cloth, and I, I think um, are, are very much worthwhile. Yeah, yeah, they do share that in common, the boy and the heron as well. You know, this non narrative element and. Um, uh, sort of a poetic realism to both of them. I'm glad to hear that you found it, that it's available if if it is for like five or six bucks. That's a little more easy mm-hmm. of an entry point for people. So check that out. Uh, the Boy and the Heron, as, as we said, is I think still in theaters, at least as we're recording this. And then Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. That is on DVD. Um, and I believe you can probably rent that via streaming as well. So... Thanks to you both. Uh, before you go, I'd, I'd love to hear a, a quick pick from each of you. We're, we're wrapping up these best of episodes. So we've already hit music. We've already hit TV in previous ones. But I want to get a pick from both of you in one of those categories, uh, a 2023 highlight. Rosalind, what, what do you want to throw out there? Yeah, so I have a single and it's music and it's called Palpita. It's in Spanish. It is a collaboration with between Camilo, who is a Colombian singer-songwriter, and Diljit Donsanj. And it is a banger. <laughs> All right. It's awesome. And, you know, it actually relates to what we've been talking about because palpita mm-hmm. means heartbeat. And so in this song, um, it's a romantic song, but they they make a point of saying, like, I can feel my heart beating. And it's like beating free. So it's like, you know, being very aware of how our emotions are felt in our body. And so that's what... Ah, how about that? Yep. Awesome. I am going to hit play on that as soon as we're done recording here. So thank you. Uh, Claude, what do you got for us? Yeah, I'm going to cheat. I need to tip my straw hat to uh, the Netflix uh, One Piece live <laughs> adaptation. I would be... Of course. I would be kicked out of the Straw Hat Pirate crew if I didn't do that. So <laughs> I, I need to do that. Um, so people know that about me already by now. But yes, that, that was quite good. And then uh, my pick would be for music, uh, artist John Guerra. I think I'm pronouncing his last name correct. It's G-U-E-R-R-A. His album, Ordinary Ways. Um, it is... Uh, the song Nazareth, especially, is just... It's deeply moving and powerful. It's a... It's the sort of album that you could call a worship album, but it doesn't sound like contemporary worship music. It just sounds... I don't mean this as a slight to contemporary worship music. I think it, it just sounds like great music and great art. And it's, it's, it's quite powerful. So I love that song. We recommend that album as a, a high pick for me from uh, 2023. All right. Well, thank you. I've, I've got an afternoon of music to look forward to. Thanks to both of you. Uh, looking ahead to 2024, is there anything uh, you guys are working on you're particularly excited about? Claude, I, I hear another book is in the works for you. Yeah, so this year um, I'm working on a book uh, that'll be a church year uh, kind of devotional. So would love people to would love folks's uh, prayers uh, as I work on that. This year it was supposed to come out in 2025, and then I'll just hopefully be catching some things and uh, here on the podcast writing some stuff for TC and and maybe a couple other places. But trying to buckle down on that project a little bit uh, here soon, hopefully. <laughs> 
Yeah. Are you doing anything so people can follow your progress or we'll just check in with you when we when we have you on again? Yeah, you can check in with me and then my sub stack, uh, just uh, Cloud Out Show, just Google me on, uh, and it'll come up. Good Things is what my sub stack is called. So I'll share some stuff there uh, in the process and some maybe some early, early little snippets. Cool. Thank you. And Russell, and what's, what's ahead for you this year? So this year, I'm actually trying to start my own writing. So I'm going to launch a website and I'm going to start writing about public theology. So like film and media and all that stuff, but also about uh, spiritual direction and um, spiritual practices. So okay, coming up soon. Yeah. Do you have um, a name for the site yet or are you still trying to nail that down? Uh, well, it's going to be rossinhernandez.com, but um, okay. it hasn't launched yet. So keep coming, well, we'll- checking back. We will. We will do that. Yeah. And I hope that means if you're going to be doing a lot of writing, you'll you'll find a time to write for us here and yes. there at Blink Christian. <laughs> okay, awesome. Love that. Well, thank you both. Um, really enjoyed touching on all these movies. Um, have a good 2024, and we'll talk to you again at some point soon. Sounds great. Thank you. As I mentioned at the top, so many great movies in 2023 meant a lot of feedback from listeners sharing their favorites from the year that was. Thomas Myers highlighted three titles, the Super Mario Brothers movie, Just a Fun Adventure, and A Love Letter to Nintendo History, Thomas says. Then Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is a masterpiece. The Shift was Thomas's other pick, a good mix of scriptural themes and highbrow sci-fi concepts. We also heard this from Aaron Potter. As ever, there were just so many great new movies this year that I just loved, and it is hard to pick just one. I loved both parts of the fabulous duology known as Barbenheimer and also loved many other obviously and deservedly popular films like Spider-Man, Across the Spider-Verse, and Killers of the Flower Moon. I will also shout out the lesser-known Polite Society as just excellent. My number one favorite of the year, though, is a smaller comedy film called Theater Camp. If you don't know it, it is the story of a struggling summer camp for theater kids in the Adirondack Mountains called Adirondacks. As a theater person myself, I have never seen a sweeter or more accurate love letter to theater kids in all their obsessive, quirky, and wonderful glory than this movie. From the madness of auditions to the overwhelmed production staff to the elation when the final curtain falls, it is all just pitch perfect and so funny along the way. The numerous child actors totally commit to it and blow their roles out of the park. Above all, though, it is a story about community and about a place where all the weird kids, and every one of them is weird in their own way, can belong and be part of the family. It looks a lot like the kingdom of heaven, which God intends to populate with the various weirdos and nobodies plucked from the highways and byways of this earth, rather than just the popular and so-called normal people. Thank you for that, Aaron. One last pick here comes from Alvar Chun. My favorite film of the year is The Holdovers. I can't seem to shake the film since seeing it about a month ago. The arc of the characters from when I was introduced to them to the conclusion felt real and tangible. Director Alexander Payne has created a story that is approachable and down-to-earth. Each of the characters are relatable, especially in their desire to connect with others, despite their resistance to it out of self-preservation. The love for the holdovers seems to be growing in my circles, and I hope that it gets more attention and love. Thank you, Oliver. Yes, The Holdovers was one of the movies we discussed on our five films for Advent episode. So check that out if you're a Holdovers fan. Thank you to all of the listeners who shared picks for this and all of our best of shows. You can find master lists of our music, TV, and movie picks over at thinkchristian.net. We hope you continue to stay in touch with us throughout 2024. You can email us anytime at tcpodcast at thinkchristian.net. Share your thoughts about the show or suggest topic ideas. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter slash X. We're at Think Christian. And then if you want to keep up with all of the articles that we publish over at thinkchristian.net, subscribe to receive our emails. Just do that at thinkchristian.net slash subscribe. The Think Christian Podcast is a listener-supported production of Reframe Ministries, a family of programs designed to help you see your whole life reframed by God's gospel story. Visit reframeministries.org for more information. Our audio engineer and post-production supervisor is John Reeder, and Reframe's co-director overseeing content strategy is Robin Basselin. I'm Josh Larson. 
Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back in a week or two to consider how another corner of our pop culture fandom connects with our faith.